We'll repost the link to our Google Sheet that has a whole lot of this information. It has helpful links of where you could go to purchase some of these items, like this item here. Uh, so as she's talking about these different things, all of the links are on the Google Sheet, which was also connected on Facebook if you, to, the, uh, to the Facebook invitation, okay? So if you can't find that, let me know. We'll make sure we get you that sheet. And uh, so Megan is, I'm going to ask her to come out in a minute. Megan Wygant, Megan is our pastor's wife. She plays oodles of roles throughout the church. We're just so thankful to have her. We're thankful that she has this knowledge. So I hope you enjoy. Megan, would you come up? Okay, I will try to talk slow. Um, I'm really excited you guys are here. I, disclaimer, I'm not an expert on any of this. The last two years have been eye-opening for our family, and it has spurred us to action. And so if any of this stuff is new, I'm just like a year and a half, two years ahead of you. It's not that I'm an expert in this. So I am learning, and I am excited to share what I've learned um, because I think it's really critical. Um, I know that there's a lot going on in the world. And there's a lot of stuff that is very, very easy to be fearful over. Um, but Jan has said over and over, we are going to pray, we're going to prepare, and we're going to share. This is not about being afraid. This is about being prepared. And this is about trusting God. And, pre and prepping in any way is not a way of saying, I don't trust God. It's a way of saying, hey, you know what? I see what you're doing and I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to take action for the things that you're calling me to do. Joseph, Noah, the, some of the people that Jane's already talked about, they were, were very, very proactive in doing what God asked them to do because there were things coming. And so as we are um, going to talk today, there's a verse, um, Hebrews 10.39, and it says, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. We know that things are coming, and we know that our salvation rests in Jesus. And so we don't know when he's coming back, but we are going to be prepared. And if you were here for um, the prophecy night, if you weren't, check it out online. I know it was recorded, but if you were here for the prophecy night, Jan and Debbie did a phenomenal job talking about what is coming, right? Like when we talk about um, the tribulation and we talk about all these things that are coming, I am not an expert. I'm not talking about that. But we know that things are coming, right? And we know that there's birth pains. And we want the Americanized, like we want the epidural version of birth pains. Nobody is like, sign me up for all of the big, big pain. Um, most of us do not want to go through pain. We don't want to go through hardships. And in America, we have been very spoiled, because we expect to go to the store, we expect to turn on the faucet, we expect, we expect things to work how we have always had them working in our life, right? We don't look back 100 years and, and look at that. We look at what we have now, and we think it will always be like this. And it is very, very hard to wrap our mind around the thought of going to the store and more than just not finding the brand that I like, finding empty shelves. And so we're going to talk about... Um, how do we prepare for some of this? So there's an analogy I like to use, and um, I think it, we can all relate because we all pay insurance, right? How many are so excited when we get to pay car insurance, monthly or quarterly? We're like, yes, they took it out again. I'm so excited. Like, most of us do not love paying insurance. Car, dental, vision, life, house, all the insurances, right? Nobody loves paying those, but... If anybody has ever been in a car accident or had damage to your car from weather or anything like that, you're glad that you had that insurance, right? Like, I can't get into a car accident and be like, ooh, I should have had insurance. I'll just add that on now. Once I'm in the accident, I'm out of luck, right? Like, I needed the insurance to pre prepare and protect my vehicle and me financially. All of this is an insurance policy, right? Like... I'm going to pay my car insurance, whether I'm in an accident or not, I have my insurance, right? Thinking of prepping as an insurance policy, but as an insurance policy, you actually get to totally use, 
because any of the things that you prep are things that you will use, food you will use, right? None of this stuff is things that we are just wasting money on. So when we're looking at why are we going to prep, things are changing really fast in our world. And even from the talk that I did a few months ago, a month ago, not even that long ago, things have changed quite a bit. And we look at, everybody knows inflation is happening. It's not like we're shocked, oh, prices are higher. Like, inflation is happening. And so what happens if the inflation keeps going up, I have a set amount of money that I can spend at the grocery store, and now my $100 a week only buys me half of what it could. For some reason, my family still expects to eat. So now I need to supplement some of the things I've prepped. Or what if we go to the grocery store and there's not items? Um, a lot of people would say, oh, it's conspiracy theory to think that things are, are going to happen. Um, all the world leaders right now are talking about famine. They're using the word famine. They're using the word global food shortages. It's not just some crazy theory anymore. They're literally telling us things that are coming, right? It's up to us to look at these things and listen to these things and to do something about it. So um, we're going to talk about um, the food side, and we're also going to talk a little bit about prepping for um, power outages. And that's a fun new one. Even since um, we talked about a month ago, now we've got lots of people talking about power outages this summer. Um, what does that look like? There is a lot, and I'm going to tell you right now, I know that this is a lot. I know that this is incredibly overwhelming. I am a type A Enneagram 8, like, let's go get them type person. And this, all of this makes me overwhelmed. And I have a lot of friends who are not that type of personality. And they are so overwhelmed. The fear and the being overwhelmed, it, it, it causes them to, like, shut down right? And so we have a choice. We know these things are coming. We can say, I'm afraid. I'm going to stick my head in the sand. Those things are still coming. Or we can say, this is overwhelming, but I'm going to start doing the things that I can do right now. Little steps. We're going to, we're going to start with this. All right. So how do we even get started prepping? It's overwhelming, right? So here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, I want you to ask yourself, the question, what are the things that you use on a daily basis? This week, this weekend, take a notepad, and I want you to take a few days, and I want you to go around and look at all the things and write down all the things that you use on a daily basis. Okay, well, I wake up, brush my teeth, that's a good thing. So toothpaste, toothbrush, take my vitamins, take my supplements. Like, the things that I do, the things that I touch, Start making a list of those things because those are things that you're going to want to continue to use regardless of what happens, right? Like, I want to still be able to brush my teeth. Yay, brushing teeth, good stuff. I want my kids to still brush their teeth. I want to still take vitamins and supplements and things like that. So some of these things, making a list of the things that you use, the things that you touch every day for a couple days. Because a lot of times we think well, of prepping of just being food or just being one area. But it encompasses everything, and everything is very overwhelming, right? Like if you're sitting here trying to think of things, we miss stuff. But if we, if we take a list and we go through and we start looking at the things I use on a daily basis, that gives us a list of things that we need to have on hand, right? The things that we want to have extra of, just in case I can't go to the store and get those items. Or those items are substantially now more expensive and I may not be able to buy everything that I want. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start looking at the things that we use on a daily basis. From toiletries, shampoo, conditioner, hand soap, we're going to start making a list of the things that we use, and we're just going to start with a list. Okay? Those things are things that we're going to want to have extra of as well. Not just the food stuff, we want to have extra of those things. Watching sale items, uh, Dollar Tree is actually a great place to get some of those items of extra toothpaste, extra razors, uh, toothbrushes, those things to have on hand are just extra, that's a great place to get stuff. Now, um, when it comes to what we eat, everybody's household looks different, 
right? Everybody's household looks, when we start talking about what food type things to prep, how many people are in your house, right? If it's, if it's just you, your house will look differently than somebody who has five or six people in it, right? Also, you're going to look at the things that you eat. If you hate rice and beans, and you're, all you have it prepped is rice and beans, you're not going to be very happy, right? Like, part of this is looking at the things that you eat and having extra of those things, right? We're going to prep the things that we eat, and we're going to make sure that we have some diversity on that, right? So if you don't like it and you're not going to eat it now, you're probably going to be really frustrated that's all you have, right? So I know that um, my husband's not very picky, but he hates tuna, like despises tuna. Me and the kids like it, so we're going to have some tuna, but I better have something else for him because he might be very, very hungry because he's not going to eat that tuna, right? So looking through the things that you, you currently eat. Now, granted, if you only like fresh vegetables, plant a garden, right? But we might have to have just some of that. Everyone loves fresh or frozen is always better than canned. But what is going to be shelf-stable? Well, canned stuff is going to be more shelf-stable than fresh or frozen, right? So looking at the, the things that you're using on a daily basis and start looking at the foods that you currently eat. What's in your pantry? If you guys love mac and cheese or you love Lipton noodles, those are good things to start with. Those are things that will be, right now, the easy things that you can get um, to start prepping on. Now, when we talk about food storage, um, there, are, there are three layers of food storage. The first layer is your short-term food storage. Open your pantries. Ta-da! Food storage. That's your first layer. Your first layer is the things that you're currently using, the things that are currently in your pantry. Your second layer is going to be your uh, short-term. Those are going to be things that have a one- to two-year shelf life. Those are things going to be... Um, that you're going to rotate through. And then you have more of a long-term. Long-term is going to be things that are going to last five plus years. Um, the biggest ways to, the biggest things that affect food storage is oxygen, moisture, temperature, and light, right? So when we're looking at the things that we're going to, so we're going to look at how, how am I going to store this, right? So if I'm looking in my pantry and I have a bunch of oatmeal, my family likes lots of oatmeal. Oatmeal is a great thing to store. So if I have a bunch of oatmeal, I'm going to have a bunch of boxes that are in my normal pantry. They're my, in my, my everyday, this is the stuff that we eat. But I also need to have extra oatmeal going forward. So, so part of that is I will have oatmeal that will go into my middle storage. Those are the things I'm rotating. So when I, when I buy my items, how I'm going to rotate them is I'm going to date them. I have my jar of recalled peanut butter here. Um, it's getting ready to go back to Costco. Um, but when I bring items into my house, I always date them. Top and front. I always put the best buy date that is on the item, whether it be a can or a box or my peanut butter, I always put my best buy date on there just so that I can rotate. Peanut butter is something, or whether it be cans of beans or veggies or whatever it is, those are things that we're using regularly. So I'm, I'm rotating them in. So when I buy, when I buy things, I'm buying extra and I'm going to put them in, in a rotation. I'm going to buy, let's say I buy three jars of peanut butter, I'm dating them, I'm going to make sure that I'm rotating what I'm buying. So I'm buying stuff and I'm not just shoving it in a closet not knowing what I have. I'm buying it to be able to put on my shelf and be able to know. So I rotate. So when I buy stuff, put the newer stuff in the back and, and pull the um, older stuff to the front. So dating all of your stuff so that you know what it is. But our best buy dates are not expiration dates. How many of you have like been like, oh, this can of green beans expires next week. I either better eat it or throw it away. We get really good at that because we've been really conditioned to that. The, the best buy dates on products are just that. They're a best buy. They are not an expiration date. Canned goods 
that have not been um, dented or they're not rusted or they've not been stored in your garage that gets really, really hot or really, really cold in Nebraska, they're just cans that have been in your pantry, they don't really expire. They have best by dates. You can use those cans for a long time. They put dates on them because they have to and you have to buy more, right? Like it was a really good marketing thing to get you to buy stuff and be able to throw stuff out so you can continue to buy stuff. But cans that have been properly stored last forever. Eventually you get a long term, your nutritional value might decrease a little bit, but the product itself is good. You can always open it up and you can do the smell test, you'll know. But being able to date it does not mean that I'm throwing out my items. It means I'm just rotating so that I'm always keeping a good rotation of what's going through there. So I'm buying the things that my family likes to eat, the things that we have, and I'm going to rotate them through my stock, right? Because I, I'm looking at what my family eats and I'm buying it. When we're looking at shelf-stable items, there's lots of things. Canned meats, canned proteins, canned... Um, uh, vegetables and beans, those are great places to start. Look at the things that you are currently eating and go from there. Um, when we go for our long-term storage, if I'm going to store something for more than a year or two, um, we have Mylar bags. And Mylar bags are these awesome little, they kind of look like foil, but they're not quite. These Mylar bar bags are great at protecting from um, light. Um, they're great at, at sealing things up because you can seal them so that they're um, airtight. They also more, normally come with oxygen absorbers too, which you can use to preserve your food. So when we bring things in that I'm putting into our more of our long-term storage or at least over a year, um, I bring things in. We've got some jasmine rice and we've got uh, pot-sized linguine. And so when I bring these in, and I put them in my Mylar bags. I put the date that I packaged them on. If they have a best buy date, I can put that on there too. And I put what it is. Because if you don't put it what it is, you have a bunch of these bags. <laughs> Surprise, dinner is whatever I pull out. Oh, look, it's oatmeal again. Um, so um, being able to have these Mylar bags are um, not super expensive. You can buy, buy them in bulk on Amazon. They're a great way of being able to preserve your food from moisture, from light, um, from oxygen, all the things that are going to make your food not last as long. Um, and then once you get Mylar bags uh, filled and sealed, you can store them in five-gallon buckets. You can store them in um, big Rubbermaid containers with lids. You can store them in ways, uh, those things that would keep them safe from bugs or rodents or anything that would come in um, a down situation. So food storage, we have three levels. We have our short term, which is pantry. We have our, um, we have our current pantry of our short term, which is one to two years, and we have our long term. So start looking at the things that you're currently using, right? If your family loves pasta, that would be a really great thing to get extra, right? So start st stocking up on some extra pasta. Um, when we, when we get pasta and we get some of these things, if we're going to use them within the first year or so, leaving them in their packages is fine. If we're going to use them for longer than that, we're going to repurpose them into uh, another container, um, like the Mylar bags. But start looking. If you love spaghetti sauce, let's buy some extra spaghetti sauce, right? Like we're going to start looking at the things that we're currently eating because those are the things that we're going to want to eat, even if I can't find it at the store. Um, so we're going to make a list of the things that we're currently eating. We're going to start getting some extra and we're going to date and rotate when we bring it into the house because we don't want to, um, we don't want to waste food. This is not not about wasting food. This is about having it, um, ready and available for when we need it. Um, there is a difference between hoarding and prepping. Hoarding says I'm going to go and I'm going to go clear out an entire aisle and I don't even really care what it is, but I want to have every box of mac and cheese that they have at the store just in case. And we don't even eat mac and cheese. Like hoarding is buying excessive amounts and not caring about the people around us, right? 
this isn't hoarding, this is being able to be prepared. And so part of this is understanding our supply chain is fragile, right? Like our supply chain has some issues right now and we don't want to go out and create more stress on our supply chain. But we can go out and we can start buying some things that our family eats and having extra of. It would be really nice if I said, hey, everybody go buy whatever you want and there's like money is not an option, so just go, go hog wild, just buy whatever. Most of us do not have the ability to just go spend whatever the heck we want and buy everything. Most of us have a budget and the budget is being stressed a little bit more now with inflation. And so part of this is being able to look at and say, okay, I can't go and buy hundreds of dollars extra food, but I might have $20, I might have $10, I might have $40. And being able to say, okay, what am I currently eating? How can I buy extra of those things now, right? So if I am buying spaghetti sauce, maybe now instead of buying my normal one or two jars of spaghetti sauce, maybe now I'm buying three or four. And when I, when I use one, I'm replacing it, right? Like I, I use one off the shelf and I'm buying extra to replace it. And I'm ha starting to do, do this. If we start buying little bits, little bits at a time, we won't crash the supply chain, but we'll be able to stock up, right? And it's doing what you are capable of doing for your family. So looking at it, um, being able to go buy the things and being able to kind of be smart with the things that you're buying. Don't buy the things that you're not eating, right? And look at, look at the things that will last on our shelf the longest. Um, having our, our freezers packed is great. However, what happens if we have those power outages that they keep promising, right? Like power outages make my fridge and freezer not real happy. They're not going to keep my, everything. So if I put all of my money into buying stuff and putting in my freezer, that power outage happens. Unless you have an amazing generator that lasts for a really long time, you might lose a lot of your food. And we don't want to, we don't want to waste food. This is not about wasting. This is about making sure we have stuff. So looking at shelf stable items, um, shelf stable meats, shelf stable veggies, shelf stable um, everything. Like we're going to look for things that we can put on our shelf that we can have regardless of power outages on that. Um, the other part with that is being able to look at our, um, our food and being able to say, how am I going to cook that if I didn't have power? Um, how am I going to cook that if I can't look up a recipe? Um, I don't know about you guys, but I've gotten really good at putting my rice in an Instapot and pushing the rice button. Like, I haven't even had to cook rice on the, like, stove in a really, really long time. So that is a, a convenience thing that I have relied on. But what happens if that Instapot doesn't work? What happens if the microwave doesn't work? What happens if I only have an electric can opener and there's no power? How do I cook through some of these things, right? Like, how do I use these? How do I feed my family? How do I take care of myself if the power is not on when it comes to cooking, right? Like, these are things that are absolutely things that we have to start thinking through. Um, so being able to start stocking our food, start looking at what we're eating, dating and rotating our stuff, and having a supply that we have on our shelves is going to be really, really important. And then looking at how am I going to cook these items? How am I going to um, preserve these items, right? So um, let's talk a little bit about the what ifs. Um, there are amazing preppers who have done this for a lot longer um, that I follow on social media. And one of them has a what if Wednesday. What if lot the, then the questions that get you thinking and what if the power grid goes down what do you do how do you how do you cook how do you um how do you communicate how do you stay cool summer in nebraska is fun we get like the best of both we get like the extreme here's negative 40 and oh hey look here's 110 like we get the whole gamut of all of it so how are we prepared for power outages in the summer, because that's coming first, right? So the what if Wednesday, let's just pretend that it's today's Wednesday. What if the power grid goes down? How do you take care of yourself? There are a lot of options on that. 
Um, and so making sure that you have lanterns, candles, things to be able to see with. Uh, these are, uh, any of the LED lights are really, really bright um, and they last for a long time. Being able to uh, make sure that you have ways to uh, see around the house. These, these are also another great thing. These are from Dollar Tree. You can put these out during the day, let them get charged because they're solar, and then you can bring them in at night. They would light up a bathroom. You can easily put them in a, in a vase or in a, a cup, and this would be something that you could take if you were worried about um, having a candle, having an open, open candle. Um, being able to have uh, chargers for phones. They have great little power banks that stay charged for a long time. This would be a great way to charge anything that uses a USB, such as they have great little fans now that you can get to charge off of a USB or solar. Um, I bought these. They're tiny, um, but they're a little... Uh, solar fans that can be charged and at least have something by your bed at night so you're not sweating your face off and actually get to maybe try to sleep if there's not air conditioning in Nebraska summers. Um, there's a lot of options when it comes to some of these things and they are super expensive but you can also do it on a really good budget of being able to have resources in the um, the spreadsheet, the Google document that Jan mentioned, we have links to a lot of this stuff. We make no money. This is not like, hey, buy these products. These are amazing. These are just things that we have been researching. We have been looking for. And these are things that we are personally buying for our families to try to help, um, to try to help us. Um, having a, uh, this is a, a solar uh, weather radio to be able to still know what's going on. Uh, it also has a nice little flashlight, and it has a USB charger on it, and it is literally just a little solar thing that also has a battery. Um, but looking through, thinking through the power outage side is now something that we get to think about as well when it comes to prepping. It's not just, I know that's a really cool background, um, it's not just the storm aspect, but when you're prepared for the power outages, you're prepared for some of this, you also get the benefit of being prepared for storms as well. Um, and with, with the um, power outages comes water. How many of you know that like when there's an extended power outage, your water is not safe to drink? That's a fun little tidbit, isn't it? Um, our water treatment plants, when power goes down, you have an ex ex set amount that has um, been filtered and cleaned. And then once that is gone, the stuff that comes behind it is not taken care of. And so water is something that we have to have to survive, and you can never prep enough water. Um, water is um, one of going to be one of our very first things that we're going to have to think about. So this um, is called a Berkey. I know it's kind of a fun name. This is a Berkey. Um, there are other products like this. Again, in that Google document, there are links to other ones. There's one called Alexa Pure. Um, LifeStraw has one. And you can actually make your own by getting the Berkey filters. Um, but the Berkey filters out, um, there is like pages and pages of everything, viruses and metals and contaminants that it does. And essentially, you can take river water, flood water, water I would definitely never drink, and run it through a Berkey, and it will clean it and make it drinkable. So um, this is, this for us, this was like our number one big investment was to make sure we had water. Uh, we set up a rain barrel system to be able to collect water, but I don't want to drink water that came off my roof. That sounds gross. So um, we got the Berkey so that we can be able to use this. Um, there are also... Lots of options. Um, this is little tablets. You can get these at Walmart. Um, you can put these tablets into not drinkable water and make it drinkable. Um, there is also, um, you can use bleach. Um, that is not my go-to, but there is um, a, you can look online and it has the amount. It's like drops per gallon. It's not a whole lot, but 
uh, bleach is actually not something that lasts forever. I did not know this. Bleach lasts like about six months. So if you're planning on storing lots and lots of bleach to be able to have clean water, bleach is not permanent either. So having um, some way, whether it be tablets or whether it be a water filtration system that you have access to clean water is going to be really important. Um, they say that you need a gallon of water per person per day, which is a lot. There's five of us in our family, and I got one of those. Um, it's a jerry can from Walmart, um, and it's a five-gallon. It's heavy when you fill it, and I'm thinking this would be for one day's worth. That takes up a lot of space. And so um, having water, water bottles, and those things are great, but eventually, like, most of us don't have a warehouse attached to our house to store all the water that we would need for our entire family. Um, it's not just drinking water. I know you're supposed to drink a gallon a day. Most of us do not do that. Um, but it's cooking, it's cleaning, it's hygiene, it's drinking. Um, there's a lot that goes with water. One of the things that we have been doing um, for water storage is every time the kids finish uh, a thing of juice, we wash out the container and we fill it with water. Whether we drink that water or we use that water for all the other things, so I'm saving drinking water for drinking. Um, the uh, big Costco-sized Dawn dish soap, when we, fill, when we finish that, I don't rinse it out. I just fill it with water. Now I have soapy water that I can use to wash dishes or wash our hands or do things with that without wasting my drinking water. Um, same thing with laundry soap containers. Um, any of the things that, that we can use to put water in, we're doing that. Those things will be used for those items regardless of whether we have to use it for drinking water. Obviously the soapy ones, not drinking that. But having other options, having gallons of water, having those things are great. Let's start there. But let's think of what happens if that faucet isn't working? What are, what are my options going to be? How am I going to um, collect water? How am I going to um, make it drinkable? Whether it's the tablets, whether it's bleach, whether it's a Berkey, um, water is super, super important. Um, another, another thing I just saw, we've had a ton of rain. I don't know if you guys have noticed. We moved to Seattle, and um, we've had lots and lots of rain, right? Well, there, most of us have some containers, whether it be buckets or whether it be uh, those Rubbermaid containers. Or most of us have things in our house that we can put outside to collect rainwater. I just watched um, a lady who had just set a bunch of, she had a couple of wheelbarrows, and she set those outside when it was raining, and then she had water for her garden, she had water for her animals. Random things like that that we totally don't think of because we can turn on the faucet. But playing the what if, what if we can't turn on the faucet? What if we don't have resources like that? Unfortunately, that's a, a reality that we need to at least start getting our mind wrapped around. We need to start prep preparing ourselves to have water to be able to have those things if those resources are not the same. Um, with that being said, um, what skills do we need and what skills do we have from people around us, right? Most of us have gotten really, really good at running to the store when we need something or hopping online like, I can make the same thing a bunch of times, but for some reason I need to look at the recipe and I have to go online to be able to do that. So what happens if I don't, if I can't hop online to be able to look up stuff? Being able to have hard copies of things is going to be really important. So for us, we have been um, buying a lot of actual books. Um, I had to get a whole new bookshelf to be able to hold a bunch of actual books, not just e-books, which I like e-books too, but just in case, having actual books, having cookbooks, um, printing off recipes. I have my great big binder um, that has all the recipes of things that I currently make or want to make sure I can still make, or things like that I should know how to make, like rice, not in an Instapot, or dry beans. I don't, most people have probably not cooked dry beans, because why? When I could go buy a can of, dry, uh, of beans that are already cooked, it saved me time. So being able to have those recipes printed off, being able to have a physical copy has been really important. Any like uh, documents, anything that you 
would want to have that you have taken for granted that is on your phone or it's on your computer. If you didn't have access to that, what would you do? Being able to um, have some paper and physical copies is really important. Um, Goodwill has actually been a great place to go find some books on uh, for cookbooks, for home repair stuff, things that a lot of people are happy to get rid of and I have been very excited to go find for cheap. Um, there are a couple other books, uh, websites that sell really cheap books. I'll have us get a, that on the uh, Google document too. But um, being able to have physical copies of stuff is going to be really important because there's a lot of skills that we have gotten used to not having to use and that we need books to be able to help it. First aid books, um, gardening books, canning or cooking books, um, health books, um, all of that stuff. Having a physical copy is really important. Um, um, and then with that is we can never really store enough just for our, ourselves, right? We need to have some skills and we need to be able to network it with other people that have skills, right? Like I don't know how to make soap. I would love to make soap. If anybody knows, come talk to me, but um, I don't know how to make soap. So being able to find somebody who does, being able to network, being able to say, okay, hey, cool, you know, you have this skill. Let's, let's teach each other how to do some of these things. You know how to can or you know how to garden because skills are going to be what's really important. If I can't go out and buy that item, whether it's too expensive now or that item is not available, I would really like to have somebody who knows how to do that or has the resources to do it. And so being able to have some skills, learning those things now, like making bread. Amazing. We have gotten really used to going to the store and buying bread because it's there and it's already sliced. How amazing is that? Right? Like, but being able to actually make our own bread, being able to do some of these things that seems so easy and it was wonderful because it was done for generations and then it got stopped, right? Learning some of these actual hand skills is going to be really important to, to do. Um, so see what skills, look at the things that you use. Think, how can I make this? How can I do this if I didn't have the ability to go to the store and just buy it for myself? Um, let's see here. It's a little bit early, but I want to see if anybody has any questions and we'll start with some of that. I want to see. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. What would be some good things to throw in the garden? What do you like to eat? Could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. So she asked, what are some good things to grow in a garden? My response is, what do you like to eat? Like, if you hate tomatoes, don't grow tomatoes, right? Like, think of some of the things that you currently like to eat and start with some of those things, right? Um, having seeds now that you can even get started on or even having seeds now that you could even use next year will be really important. Um, so think of some of the things that you, you like and um, there's lots of gardening books. There's lots of resources online of uh, people that you can follow that we are constantly watching people and getting tips from them on the things that they're growing and how can we do that? How can we use that in our space? Um, Gardening is fantastic, and I know a lot of people are like, but I live in an apartment, or I don't want a massive garden. I'm not allowed to till up my yard. What do I do? Container gardening is super easy, and you can use really any container. Um, we had another, we had five yards of dirt. Five yards is a lot, and I'm pretty sure this was way more than five yards because this was the never-ending pile of dirt. And so we were looking for things to put the dirt in because we had filled up everything else, and we had those recycling, those green recycling tubs that we don't need now here in Omaha. They just became three container gardens. There's lots of things that you can do in small spaces, whether it's an apartment, whether it's a house that you're, not a, you're renting and you can't till up a yard, whether you just don't want the whole work and you're just going to put a little garden on your patio. You can use cont containers, Rubbermaid containers. Lowe's right now has 27 gallon um, black with the yellow lid Rubbermaid type containers for $15. We have a couple of those now that are going to be container gardens as well. Megan, can you say some of the things that you're that you are planting to give people an idea? Yeah. So um, 
we're trying a bunch of new stuff. This is also kind of our guinea pig year. Um, we, we had a big garden in Virginia. We have not gardened in Nebraska, which is a different growing cycle. Um, and it's different. So we're trying new things because we have the freedom to do it this year, um, hoping that gives us knowledge for next year. So we're, we've got potatoes. We've got uh, cucumbers and carrots. We've never been successful in carrots. That, that's a whole experiment. Um, we've got lots of tomatoes and peppers and onions, trying leeks. Um, we got raspberries and blueberries and some strawberries. Thanks to the farmer's market, we got some starters. Um, squashes, all the squashes. Um, part of this is like looking at okra. We've never grown okra. That sounded fun. And they had orange okra. How cool is that? I don't know if it'll taste good, but it looks cool. So some of this is, is experimenting. We have some of the freedom right now. Um, but putting things in containers, you can do pretty much like a salad. You can do lettuces, you can do tomatoes, you can do a lot of those in just little containers. So look at what you like to eat and start with that. Um, a lot of the stores right now still have um, the starter plants. Start with that and then buy the seeds to go with it for next year. Um, you can do, you can save if it's an heirloom, um, if, if it's an heirloom, non-GMO plant, you can save the seeds and grow grow those seeds next year. Um, we bought a book on how to save seeds. I don't, know, I don't know how to save seeds. So like how to save those seeds so that we can then use that the following year. So gardening is a, is a great way to do that. There's tons of um, resources on that. Um, but look at the space that you have. They even have this cool, uh, like a lettuce tower or it's an herb tower and it takes up very small space like a square foot and it has all these layers you can do we've got lettuces you can do herbs you can do strawberries you can do lots of things in that and that's little space um so don't don't be intimidated and think you have to have a whole yard to do a garden you don't start small start with something that that you like to eat that you can plant that's one less thing that you're buying at the store that's one less thing that you're dependent on being there and it may be something that your neighbors have stuff to and be like, hey, look, I grew tomatoes. And they're like, hey, I grew peppers. Hey, now we can have salsa. Like being able to, to trade, being able to look at that. But starting with a garden is phenomenal. Archer. The foods. So food saver bags are very good too. Yep. Question. He was asking the the bags that you can put the food in and suckle the air out. Those are the food saver bags, and they kind of do the same thing as that, like uh, that an oxygen absorber will do. Um, again, so like Cliff bars. Cliff bars um, have and they have nuts. Okay, some of them have nuts and some of them have oils in them. So oils and nuts will go rancid faster than rice and, and beans. Those things do have a shorter best buy date on them. If you're going to put them in the uh, vacuum sealed bags, you have to make a little cut in the package itself so that it can suck the air out of it. Oh. So you can put them in there, but you have to make a little cut to suck, to suck the air out of it. And then those are great too. So then you would take that and you would date best buy date and being able, able to put them in, in a storage thing would be good. They are. Well, and think protein bars are great. Having like we use a lot of protein powder in our house. So buying, if I find it on sale, um, I stock up on it. That's something that I know that we use. That's something that I know that I want to have. Protein is really important for our family. And so... Yeah, anything like the protein thing, you take a jar, that won't last a year, no doubt. But if you vacuum seal it properly, it lasts a year. It could, and those actually do have a, a pretty decent shelf life on them. Um, and so, again, looking at... and, and Putting oxygen absorbers and some of those things, absolutely. In the spreadsheet that we put together in the Google Sheet, at the very last page of it, there's a list of items, and it says what the shelf life is, whether or not they need an oxygen absorber, whether or not they can be yeah. put in the food saver. So if you go to that Google Sheet, it has a whole list of items. Yeah, that Google Sheet really does. I mean, we have been compiling that for a while now. It has links to the things that we're talking about so that you don't have to go searching for it. It has um, YouTube videos if you want to watch people, like, show you how to use items. It, um, 
It tells you the shelf life and stuff. It gives you items to prep, things like that get you thinking. Um, those lists, um, they're all on that Google document. It is fantastic. And I didn't print it because you can't click on links from, from a printed page. So um, if you cannot find it, please email me or Jan, and we will make sure that we get it to you because it has a ton of good information on it. Yeah. Absolutely. So they do. And I, that is on my, I sure wish that would happen list. Um, I'm going to put it on and ask Santa for that one. Um, it's not happening. But the solar generators are great. Generators are, are fantastic, right? But you need what for a generator? gas and you need lots of gas and then you need to be able to store the gas you need to be able to put the the stabilizer to have long term and you have to have enough space to store it. and then the bit then the problem with a generator is everybody in the neighborhood knows what you have now you're a target congratulations um so having a a generator for short-term power outages those are, those are okay, but they're not going to last you for long term but solar gener generators are great but they are substantially more expensive because of that, and because you can run them inside, you charge them outside, you run them inside, and nobody knows what you have. So, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Anything with solar can be, but they, actually, Amazon has a bunch of little smaller items um, that are solar that are not super expensive. And I, they have the solar cooker, yeah. Yeah, and I've been kicking myself because for some reason, my, I have a, solar usb charger and i have it's run away from my house and i'm i have lost my mind today looking for this thing it, they're about 24 to 24 to 30 dollars on amazon right now and it's a little solar usb charger that will charge my fans that will charge my charger that will charge my radio um all of those things the, the little usb thing that is a that is a cheap easy thing to have to be able to charge some of those things. So solar is always good, but they can get you on the money side with solar. But having, you said the solar cooker, there are, there are, so there are lots of options when it comes to cooking without electricity. You can do the propane, but again, you have to have store propane. You have to refill propane. You have to be able to do that. The little, they have little rocket stoves. They have the little, um, you can make them with, uh, cinder blocks and bricks. If you, again, YouTube videos has all those things, but a little mini grill. Um, those are little things that you can, you can have to be able to cook, heat up water, cook your rice, cook your pasta, whatever. Um, those do not take up a lot of space, but you need to then think, okay, I have a little grill. What am I going to use for fuel? Maybe I'm going to use charcoal. Awesome. Have a lot of charcoal. Maybe you're going to use wood. Fantastic. Are you going to be a beaver and chew through the wood, or do you have something to go get wood from? Like, thinking through some of these things on every step, and I know it seems overwhelming. I know it's every single thing. You're thinking of, how am I going to use it? But if we start thinking through those things now, and we start accumulating little things as we are going, it's not as overwhelming if we think of, like, okay, this week, what is one thing that I can get? Or what is a couple things that I can get this week? Or maybe it's on this paycheck. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go out to eat. I'm not going to, I'm going to take some of my coffee money or whatever, wherever our money seems to disappear to. I'm going to take that money and I'm going to put it to getting some extra food. I'm going to put it to getting some, some of these little LED lanterns. And then they have a four pack of these on Amazon. I think they're like 20 bucks and they're super bright. Um, like, so things like that, 20 bucks here and there. I know it adds up, totally aware of that. And I'm not saying go blow all your money, but I'm saying there are little things that we can start doing that make a big difference when we add to our supply. Yeah. That's a great question. She asked, how long are we thinking? Is it weeks? Is it months? Years? Yeah. All of it. Like, so here, here, here's a good starting point. Two weeks worth. Do you have two weeks worth of extra supplies in your house? If the answer is no, 
I, I, I have some family friends who literally, if I need something from the store for that day, I go and buy it. They kind of pretend like they're in Europe, I guess. And they go only to the store for that, that meal. I'm only going to buy this stuff for that meal. And I'm going to take it home and I'm going to cook it. And that means tomorrow I have to go back. If that's how you function, you need to start getting stuff. The goal, having two weeks worth of stuff. Okay, when you have two weeks worth of stuff, okay, now my goal is going to be a month or two months worth of stuff. We, the thing is, is we don't know. I mean, if we look at our country, if you look at the last two years, things have changed a lot in two years, right? I don't know how long it's going to take to recover from a world famine, like, like a global famine. When they're talking about drastic wheat shortages in a matter of 10 weeks, when they're talking about like other, like, sugar is going to be cut off because our sugar country, the countries that provide sugar are not exporting anymore. When we start looking at some of those things, I don't know how long it takes to recover on that. And we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't know how long we'll be here for birth pains. We don't know any of that. So my goal is I'm going to prep as much as I can. I'm going to prep two weeks. Okay. Then the next step, I'm going to prep for a couple months. And then the next step, I'm going to prep for a couple more months. And I'm going to keep building my supply. The thing is, is, it's not going to be wasted. I'm going to eat it because I'm using and I'm rotating and I'm, I'm using the stuff that I have. I do have stuff in rice and beans and pasta and oats and some of these things in my long-term storage. But again, they last. I've, I've prepared them. They're going to last. So if I'm here in five years, I'm going to use them. Um, none of this stuff is stuff to, to be wasted. We're not buying 50 cans of Spam to leave on your shelf to never be used, which I have heard that is pretty much good indefinitely. Godspeed. Um, <laughs> uh, my daughter did, did try to convince me that she would need to try that in the apocalypse, and so we do have, we're a proud owner of three cans of Spam. Those are on her. Um, but like, I, I'm not buying things that I, I'm going to put away and never and never touch, but I am prepping for as long as I can. Jan? And you oh. Yeah, yeah. So um, there are two types of buckets. We have, this is just a normal, regular bucket, and then we have our food grade bucket. Um, food grade is the things that you obviously can put food directly into. Um, the other ones could have chemicals let's be honest, they all have chemicals, but um, anything that is going into a regular bucket, I'm putting in mylar so my food isn't in direct contact with the bucket. If it's a food grade bucket, typically I still use mylar too just because it's easier to have a bunch of stuff, but you can put those items, like I could pour a 50 pound bag of rice, granted it only holds 25 pounds so don't try to put a whole 50 pound bag in there, but you can pour it in there. And then there's, there's lids. So there's the normal, like, uh, five-gallon bucket lid, which if you've ever tried to get those off, say goodbye to your fingers. Like, they're awful. Um, and they have this little, like, bucket opener, which is a couple bucks. Buy that when you buy the lid. You'll save your hands um, and lots of, of anger. But they also have, this is called a Gamma Seal lid. Um, these lids are really great for things that I'm going to be getting into. So let's say... I have a bucket full of oats, and this is going to be, um, I have my pantry oats. These are the oats I'm getting into every time my kids want cookies. Those are my oats, or my or oatmeal, whatever. And then I have my, my short-term storage oats. I'm going to probably put a gamma lid, because what happens is you can just, um, you, you get it on, and then you can just unscrew it. Like the lid itself, like this part, comes off. So I don't have to lose my fingers and, and yell every time I have to open a five-gallon bucket. This, this you just snap on. And then, so let's say for my oats that are going into my short-term storage, I would put them in there. And then I can use those to refill my pantry. And then, and then my long-term would be my mylard. They're off. So let's say this now is empty. I would take something from my long-term with my mylar, open it up, pour it in there. Because oats are things like that that I'm going to be like, scooping out of. I want it to be able to seal again. And so the gamma lids are really good. Gamma lids can get pricey. I haven't really found a ton on Amazon that are uh, super affordable. Actually, I got this at Menards. Um, I think they were about $6 a piece. Um, they can get really pricey, so don't pay that if they're crazy expensive. Um, this one was from Menards. Menards? 
You know, save big money at Menards. Um, but they have, uh, they have the buckets anywhere. I mean, like Lowe's or whatever. Also, you can check with bakeries. Um, you can check with sandwich shops. They give five-gallon buckets. I will say if it smells like a pickle, it's always going to smell like a pickle. They're really hard to get pickle smell out of, but it's safe. Like, especially if I'm putting my Mylar bagged food, my pantry might smell like a pickle, but it's safe. Um, having five-gallon buckets is also another great thing because if it's raining, I can go collect rain. I can uh, grow. I pop a couple holes in the bottom of that. Now you have a container for your garden. Congratulations. You can plant a tomato in that bad boy. I mean, like, um, so five-gallon buckets are a phenomenal thing to have on hand. Yeah. The Mylar bags. Um, I got these on Amazon. Yes. Amazon, um, pretty much all good things can come from Amazon or Costco. So uh, at least in our house, we get lots of things from there. But um, Amazon, uh, there, actually, this company, Wallaby, you can buy directly from their website. Um, do we have the $5 off in the Google document? Back to our list of everything. There is a $5 off coupon code um, that you can use to get $5 off your thing. Um, they have lots of different sizes with the Mylar bags. Literally, it's this. And um, some of them, this brand does not stand up so well. Some of them have better things. Uh, pro tip here, I've learned this the hard way multiple times. Put this in a big bowl or a bucket to fill it. Don't try to hold it open and pour it. Let's just say we had a lentil party everywhere like confetti. We have lentils all over. It was a lot of fun. Um, I also made the mistake with rice and oats because I'm a slow learner. But um, the uh, if you can get the ones that stand, they're easier to fill. But once you fill it, most of them come with oxygen absorbers. Oxygen absorbers are great. In our Google documents, it says what foods to use oxygen absorbers with. Um, you never use it with, with sugar unless you want to like chisel your sugar off. Um, but most foods you can use oxygen absorbers with, but um, it has a list in there. But you, once you open the, the packet, you want to be able to do all of your you want to use all of these at one time because once oxygen hits it, it's sucking out the ox oxygen. Um, it does not suck out. It won't vacuum seal the bag. It's taking the oxygen out, but it doesn't vacuum seal it. And then once you put the oxygen absorber in it, you can use an iron. You can use a flat iron. I seal, obviously, I don't use a flat iron, but my daughter does. And so I seal her flat iron, and I just, you just take it in low heat, and you seal it. Um, some of them have a zipper seal and so I zipper it, and then I flat iron it so that it's double sealed. But then I know it's good. Like, I can squeeze it. No air is coming out. And I know that the, the stuff in here is good. But uh, these normally come together, uh, the Mylar bags. And again, this would be for, like, your, more of your longer-term storage. Um, I wouldn't be putting this stuff in Mylar bags for things that are going right into my pantry that I'm planning to use, like, next week. Because that'd be a waste of money. And I don't... So um, you want a bag that's at least five mil thick. Um, you don't want it to be really thin because you want it to be durable. Um, there's like, I think it's five mil and seven mil. Um, you want the, the, the thicker bags because if they're... Yeah. Yeah, there's some that are like three. Yeah. Yeah, you want to, it depends on how many. I think this one might have six in it okay. or five. I don't have many and this is how many bags I want to be able to do. And some of the bigger the bag, you might have to use multiple oxygen absorbers on that. But making sure that you always date and put what's in it because they're not clear and they all look the same. And so that would be very, very confusing. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's, that is a great thing. So she said that the thickness of the bag, keeping uh, vermin and things out. So most of us, when we buy a product, we use it, 
before things could hatch in it. Now, this is disgusting, and I'm sorry if I ruin your life by saying this, but there's a lot of things that actually have eggs in some of the products or little bugs, it right? Would be, it would be in the uh, boiling. Uh, uh, it's not hard. Right? Yeah. In the box, yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, yep. Yes. It can't. And so if you're storing things for long term, normally you eat like cereal, you would eat it before any of that would happen. Um, so when you buy rice or if things that you're storing for long term, oats, rice, beans, pasta, even some of those things, there's two methods with that. You can put it in a freezer, typically like a freezer or deep freezer for uh, a few days to a week, um, normally three or four days to a week, and it would kill anything um, and then you would bring it back to room temperature before you would bag it because you don't want condensation because then you've just ruined your whole product. So you would let it come back. The other thing is, is nothing can live without oxygen. So if you have an oxygen absorber in it, technically you don't need to do um, any of the freezing stuff first because it wouldn't survive in here without the oxygen. Um, but yes, you don't want to have bugs. Now with that, if things got really crazy and there wasn't trash service or let's say diesel runs out because you know that's another fun thing they're throwing around let's say there's not diesel we don't have trash service bugs and rodents are going to be a possibility because we are trashy people our country we have lots of trash we have lots of products we're throwing our boxes away we're throwing our cans away and so um bugs and insects are going to be a something we want to take care of so having things in as much protection as we can i heard mice are awful but they i heard they can chew through five gallon buckets um so part of this is we're doing our best right like we can't per do everything but having it sealed having it in as much protection as possible is going to be really important um having extra traps and things like that are, are good too to protect against the bugs yeah i'll get a cat yes That, so she asked if you can't stay in your home. So there's a term called bug out. And it's not the bugs you're just talking about. It's like you're leaving, you're leaving your area. Um, yes, having a, a bug out bag is important. But you, need, you would need to have a place to bug out to. Like I'm not leaving the safety of my home, even if my neighborhood goes crazy. I do not want to leave the safety of my home if I don't have any place to go, right? So, like, if you're thinking of if things got really scary where you're at and you would want to leave, yes, you need to have a bag ready that would need to have essentials. Thinking, okay, if I have to travel by foot to Kansas City, that is how far away. I would need to print directions because I'm directionally challenged, and I would rely on my GPS, which wouldn't be available. So I would need to find, figure out how I'm going to get there, and I would need to have the resources in my bag to get me there. But as, as opposed to, unless you have a place to go, just randomly leaving and wandering is not a good idea. Um, having the resources at your house, being able to um, have a secure, secure place is going to be the best thing. But if you want to talk about bug out bags and um, bugging out, I can talk to you about that afterwards. There we go. And a lot of people keep them in their cars. They keep them in, in their cars because what, one of our what if Wednesdays, what if you are away, you are out on a trip or you are at work and something happened and you couldn't get home, you couldn't drive home, how do you get home? What, re, what do you need? If you work in heels or not shoes you're going to be walking in, do you have an extra pair of shoes? What if it's really, really cold or rainy? Do you have gear in your car? Um, what if you're somebody who likes to snack? Do you have snacks in your car? Do you have water in your car? Things like that. Um, a lot of people have a bag in their car as a go bag, um, but that is a little bit different for prepping. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a lot of it is, is thinking for 72 hours, I'm going to get some place that would be safer. I need to have a 72-hour bag to get me there, and I have a lot of stuff. A lot of those things you can look at, and you can buy the bags already made, or you can look at what's in there and put it together yourself. 
it, a lot of times a little bit cheaper if you piecemeal it together. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, and first aid. Um, when you're, when you're th having extra mess. And, and thinking th through, too, um, if, you're, if you're on a prescription, having an extra supply, but, but having resources of, and figuring out what happens if I don't take this. Um, what happens if I have to, I'm limited on, on my supply of that. Do not go off medications. I am, I am not telling you to go off medications without talking to your doctor, but being able to think through, if I can't get this, what do I do? What's going to happen? Um, is there any over-the-counter something that would, would work, or is there any herbal things that would maybe help suffice for some of that? Um, having medications, having things, like what if I just can't get to the doctor, like cold and flu medicine, um, cough medicine? We don't ever take that. But if we couldn't get to the doctor and something happened with my kids, I bought some extra. Um, Costco or Sam's Club is a really great place to buy bulk stuff of that. Um, if you don't have a membership, hit up a friend who does and go with them. Sam's actually does a really good job of uh, running specials where you're like, for $19, I bought a membership and I got a free chicken, a $10 e-gift card, and a thing of cupcakes. I know, it's crazy, right? Like they pretty much pay, but being... So I, I personally am a Costco girl, but Sam's has better membership prices. And buying bulk vitamins, buying bulk uh, medicines, buying uh, bulk uh, shampoos and cleaners, hand soaps, um, things like that. Thinking through, too, of hygiene. Hygiene is really important. And that was a big thing with a lot of the plagues and a lot of the stuff that took people out. It wasn't the illness itself. It was the hygiene side of it. And so being able to... Um, Wash your hands. Do you have water? Am I wasting my drinking water to wash my hands? Do I have soap? Um, we use those foamy hand soaps, or those pumps, I mean. I make my own, but we use the foamy pumps because it takes significantly less soap, very little water, and it lasts for a long time. And so um, do we have enough of those things to have on hand to stay clean, to be able to do that? That's going to be a really important thing. I also, oh, I did bring it. This is a solar shower. I got this at Walmart or Amazon, I don't know. Um, and you can add water to it and then hang it outside or lay it outside and the, the sun warms it. I hate cold showers, so I'm excited about this. Um, but it will warm it and so you would at least be able to take a super quick military shower. Um, or also I plan on using, having one of these I can hang over my kitchen sink to help with dishes. Um, but these are like eight or nine dollars and it holds five gallons of water. And so even if I had to collect some rainwater in my bucket that I put into this and I drug into the house, and then I would at least have some water to be able to wash my hands, shower, do dishes. Um, this is a pretty cheap, easy, easy thing to have on that. Um, That is, so she was talking about having um, lighters they were using over in Europe to be able to light fires, stay warm, which I haven't talked about the, the winter side of stuff because we're going into summer, but yes, that's a whole nother joyful, although it could be winter next week, I don't know, it is, it's weird here. Um, but, but having that, but one of the things that Texas did when they had their huge freeze, they were not prepared for that. They had tents. They put the tents on their bed and put a blanket over their tent, and they were toasty warm in there. So being able to think through the winter side, but right now we're all dealing with the, the crazy heat that could be coming. But lighters are good. Having matches and lighters, um, I will say with the bartering side of it, you have to be very, very careful because if people know that you have something, they, desperate people will do desperate things. And we have not seen, we have not seen people starving here. We've seen people hungry, 
uh, uh, there are communities and there are places in our country that, that deals with hunger, but for the most part, most of us have never seen literally starving people. And um, That's going to have to be a personal choice. I can't tell you what to do on that. As Christians, there's both sides of that. As Christians, she said, what do you do when you, know, you have and your neighbors don't and they come knocking at your door? What do you do? And as Christians, what do we do? Yeah. You can educate your neighbors. You can, you can try to, t- can help, to help your, tell your neighbors. Part of it is to... My responsibility is my children. My responsibility is my children. And if you start handing things out, they keep coming back. And you may not be... Are you prepared to defend what you have is what what I'm trying to say. And to what area, how far will you go to defend it? There is a lot, and I can't tell you what to do on that. Um, There's a lot of different... um, thoughts with that. I'm on, there's a Christian preppers page that I, that I follow, and they, there's lots of different thoughts on, on how far you go in sharing, and um, that's going to have to be a personal decision on that. Um, but you also need to be prepared to defend yourself. The, when you are prepared and others are not, which has a degree to it. We, being prepared to defend yourself is absolutely, I mean, defense is going to be great, and I'm, I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you what the best form of defense for your family is, but you have to be able to think, um, have I protected my home? Have, have I secured my home with what I can? Have I, do I have open windows? Do I have blinds closed? Do people know what we have? One of the things we've been getting is blackout curtains, not just so people don't know what I have, that I have lights if they don't or whatever. They can't see that I, what I'm doing. But in the summer, blackout curtains are going to keep us cool because during the day, you can close them up. So being able to, having extra locks and security on your doors, being able to do some of that stuff, people will get desperate. Um, and, and being able to, to defend your yourself um, is going to be a personal choice on how far you're going to go to do that. Sue, did you have a question? Any other questions? Yeah. Where do you store any of this stuff? Oh, that is a great question. Okay, so I, okay, the question is where do you store all this stuff? And I would love to say I have this massive warehouse attached to my house and I just keep filling it up. And I don't. Our house here in Nebraska has significantly less storage than we had in Virginia. And so we are getting creative. And here's the deal. We all have way more space than we realize. I guarantee we have linen closets and pantries and things that are not the most efficient, right? So for us, we started going through and we started um, pulling things out of the linen closet and and ours are are really deep and then the top shelf is like freakishly high. It's like, what am I going to put up there? You know what fits up there? Paper towels and toilet paper. Like, if my shelves are super deep and I, I, I would lose stuff in the back, what are things that I can put back there that take up space that are things I'm going to need to store or be able to rotate? Under beds. Um, unfortunately, all of our beds are have low frames except for one of my daughters, and she has a really tall frame. In fact, we can fit two uh, Costco uh, water, cases of water stacked high under her. So her whole bed it, underneath is just water. Um, closets, um, stacking things in in the closets. Um, My other daughter has her bed on the other side of her bed between her bed and her wall. It fits these five gallon buckets just perfect. And so she has a line of five gallon buckets. Why? Because that was stuff that used to fall over there and go to no man's land. So now stuff can't get lost. And we got five gallon buckets. Part of this is being creative. Um, You cannot store stuff in a a garage or an attic that is not temperature controlled because again temperature light affect your storage you have to be able to store it in something and you want to be able to see it right like i want to be able to see if somehow a mice got a mouse got into my house 
and was chewing through a bucket, I would want to know, right? So look through the space that you have. If you haven't used something in years, and it's not something that would work in a situation like this, maybe it needs to be rehomed. Maybe somebody else can repurpose it. Maybe you have space that you just didn't know. I've seen people who took um, the Rubbermaid containers, you know, the big Rubbermaid containers. They stacked two of them high. They put a tablecloth. Ta-da, you have an end table. I mean, part of this is getting creative. There are uh, uh, pages for apartment prepping. If you live in an apartment, you still can do this. You might have to get more creative. Um, I mean, I would love to say I have, you know, a 6,000 square foot house and I have nothing but space. And I don't. And we had, for us, we had to really, really figure out priorities, um, function over looks. Um, I, I put some, a bookshelf someplace I didn't really want a bookshelf because I wanted a place to put all of my resources. Um, we had, Brian no longer has an office at home. Well, it's now downstairs in our basement in the middle of the room because that room was like an extra bedroom slash office. That is not that anymore. Now we can put some storage stuff in there. Um, look at the space that you have and think, do I really need this or would it be better off if I put food in that, in that space or um, buckets or rubber made containers or books or any of the things that you're going to need for storage. Look at your space. If you get creative and you start really prioritizing stuff, I guarantee most of us have more space than we realize. And we probably have stuff we haven't used in a long time that needs to go away. And maybe that's a barter item, extra towels or something like that. That isn't a food item. Um, but um, that was a great question. Anything else? Yeah, Sue. The sauces, yeah. Well, glass jars are good. Then you have jars to reuse for other things. You can't can with them, but you can. And, and when it comes to storage with that, so if you go to Walmart and you get, um, Hy-Vee doesn't do this, but Walmart does, they store on their shelves like their green beans in a can. They have it like a little, in a little flat box, right? If you buy that flat, it holds 12 cans. And then you can stack those, can, those, those boxes. If you try to stack the cans, why some companies make cans that stack and some don't, I don't understand that. But they always will topple over. But if you buy the flat, it's 12. Think, think through some of these things. Does, do I need name brand or do I just want more of the product? Well, if I buy the great value brand, it's 57 cents as opposed to $1.24, I can buy more. If you just buy 12, like a, a flat of those at a time, now you have 12 cans of whatever. You can mix and match, but you have 12 cans and then you can start stacking them, whether it be fruit, whether it be uh, the spaghetti sauce, those jars. Again, buy them in the boxes. And Walmart is really happy for you to take their boxes Sometimes I'll just go and I just need the extra box flats. I'm like, I'm just taking these. And they're like, take more. Like, they don't care. So um, you have that to stack. The best buy date on the great value is when it's further out from the main brand, too. There you go. And I will say that when you're checking, when you're in stores, um, I have noticed that a lot of the best buy dates, I get this stuff home. And I, it's newer, so I should be putting it in the back of my supply. The best buy dates are actually sooner. So I'm putting them in the front of my supply. So now what I do is when I'm at the store, I check the can for the best buy date and I try to find the cans that have the longest for this date out. Again, it's, it's best buy. There was a lady on one of my pages I followed the other day, had a can of chicken five years past the best buy date. Totally fine. Like it was, the, it was, the water was clear. It looked exactly, the can was exactly the same. It wasn't dented. It wasn't bloated. I don't buy dented cans anymore. I check my cans very carefully because again, that has messed with the structural integrity of the can. So what the can isn't dented, it's not bloated, it's not rusted. The product in there is good. Um, and obviously when you open a can of something, you would know if it wasn't, you would smell it. But um, the uh, Best Buy dates are good to at least check and make sure. I will say peanut butter, now that we have our fun little recall, but what, lately, especially Hy-Vee, when they've been running their sales on stuff, a lot of the times I've been looking at their sales 
and their best buy date was in months, not years. Like most of the peanut butter I was buying, it was like 2024. I was getting, I, I went to Hy-Vee because they had their 88 cent peanut butter and I was like, yay. And I got it home and it was like November 22. So they're getting rid of some of their older stock. Um, so just check, check it. Again, it's not going to go bad, but that's something you're going to want to be aware of. So again, it's at the front of your stash, the things that you're using. Um, yeah. So I've heard, I've heard you get, you can have 18 months past best buy date on that. Again, nuts uh, and oil go rancid. So you will know when you open it, it's rancid. Um, so nuts and oil are things you can't store tons of for long term. Now, if it's something you eat a lot of, you could have, have it for that duration. But um, like cooking oil and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it has less oil, but it does still have some oil. So it's, it won't be an indefinite product. The, pe the peanut butter flour. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Those, they're great for smoothies, which we probably won't have, but, um, Yeah. It should be. I will say there's a lot of the stores are getting tricky on some of this stuff. Like Walmart and some of them, it, they'll have a bunch of front face stuff, and you go to get in the back, there's not hardly anything there. They're pulling everything to the front of the shelves on a lot of stuff um, because there's just not a lot to fill some of the other product on that. But with, with some of that too, um, I think, I don't know, I said something about cooking oil, which made me think. Um, cooking oil shortages, but having cooking oil um, is going to be important if you're trying to, to do stuff, especially you need something to keep things from sticking, right? You need to have something. So cooking oil, but also spices. Nobody wants, I love rice, but plain rice, I don't want to eat that every day or just plain beans. No, thank you. Um, like having s seasoning and spices is really important. Um, having extra salt, huge. We need salt in our diet. Right, like I mean, if we're especially if we're not eating a bunch of fast food, or we're not getting our snacks and the the things that we would normally get a higher salt intake on, um, we need salt in our diet. So um, having salt, having seasoning, having flavoring, having herbs in your garden is phenomenal because now you have basil, you have thyme, you have oregano, things like that that you want to add to that you can dry or use fresh. But seasoning, the, the, it's there's a thing called food fatigue. If you only ate unflavored rice and beans every day, would you be excited about it? Or would you suddenly say, oh, I think I'll pass. Like you, you would start not eating. And a lot of it is if you eat the same thing every day, the food fatigue, and if you don't have any flavor in it, nobody wants that. So, storing spices is really easy. Um, they last longer than, they may lose some of their potency, but again, spices last a long time too. Um, you can store all those. Um, Any other questions? Yes, sir. Keeping warm in winter. So I said that the tent thing that they used in um, Texas, that was a big thing of having a tent, putting it on your bed. I mean, you can sleep on the floor, but I'm going to sleep on my bed. Um, putting a tent on the bed, putting blankets over it, um, having extra blankets, having wool socks, having um, ways, if your house is really drafty, the plastic... Th uh, stuff to seal up your windows. If you know there's uh, areas in your house that are going to be colder doing that, um, obviously wood-burning stoves are great, but that's not something most people are um, quick to install. And so uh, having, if you have a fireplace, awesome, but do you have wood for that fireplace? Um, so thinking through some of those things, layers, um, there are some uh, makeshift little like terracotta pot heaters, people have said have, have worked in small spaces. Those are kind of hit and miss on some of those. Um, but again, think through your space. One of the things that you can do is body heat is great. So if you put people in, a, in certain rooms and then block off the other rooms and you're staying together, that helps too. Um, I will say my dogs put off a lot of heat. I don't know. You were going to get a cat for the mice, maybe get a couple dogs to sleep with. You know, they say it's a three dog night or something like that. Um, 
I would say I'd share, but my dogs won't go anywhere else. Um, but having, so think through your space. What do you have? What are some of the, the, um, the holes in your layers of, of, of heat, of cooling, of some of those things that you need to start filling in? Um, I mean, yes, we're thinking of, of summer now, but we don't know how long power outages would go. We don't know what the craziness of our wor- world has. And so, yes, thinking through the winter side of it, too, um, would be very good. And some stuff you can buy on sale now as like the end of the season stuff. Um, if you don't care about what it looks like, whether it be boots, whether it be uh, thermals, I think I saw at Walmart, they had some wool socks. If you go through the clearance section, you can find some random things sometimes. Um, making sure you have a, a good winter coat, um, you know, the blankets, the, the flannels, and some of those things that, that would be necessary to stay warm is going to be really important. Um, being able to uh, have, even if, um, even if you can't have the fireplace, uh, do you have an outside fire source that you could at least cook on for some of those things as well? So, yeah. Archer. Absolutely. Yeah, thinking of your animals. And again, we've seen... Because otherwise they'll eat you. <laughs> they might, or, or they're going to eat your, the people who are breaking into your house. I mean... Um, yeah, if you have animals, being able to store for them. And again, their food um, has oils and fat in it, and so they will go rancid. You will not have like a five-year supply of dog food. Um, as we've seen... Dog food's being rationed. Cat food was hard to get for a while. So, um, yeah, being able to store stuff up and then being able to know what what human foods animals can eat um, in like case canned, you need to. The canned dog food, dog food does last longer. Um, and so, yeah, it, but again, it's a little more expensive, so can you be able to store enough? And you've got big dogs, so they would eat a lot. So being able to do that. But, yes, having extra. We have four dogs one of them is on insulin. They're not going to make it. But um, the the other ones, I mean, what we got to be able to store food for them. We got to have to be able to have some of that. So that's things that we've been thinking about as well. Um, but again, I can't store 50 pound bags of food a ton. I don't have the space. Sue. Megan, can you speak to the soil? Okay. So we talked about that um, water wouldn't work if there wasn't power. With that comes the toilet. Um, so we, we, there are a couple of videos that we have been watching. And I know that there's links in the uh, Google document as well. So with that is the concern of how do we dispose of waste? How do we keep uh, raw sewage from coming back into our house? If the, if the pumps go down long term, that keeps everything away. How do you keep that from coming up? Um, there are some Google things in the Google documents that are links to those. Um, we have been researching those things, but we have not had to personally use those things. So we are not experts on it, but we've been asking people, trying to get advice, watching videos on how to do it. There's some cheap products that you can buy at like Lowe's and stuff that you can plug drains with to be able to um, do that. But for toileting wise, um, our handy dandy five gallon bucket. Um, now I will say there, people say to cut a pool noodle and put it on top. So it's a little padded pool noodles, hold bacteria. Don't do that. Uh, you can go to Walmart in their camping section and they have this toilet seat with a lid and everything. Um, you can snap it onto a five gallon bucket. Um, the, one of the videos that we watched, it talked about putting contractor bags, not regular trash bags, but contractor bags, um, in the five gallon bucket. Um, and then you can use kitty litter. You can use, I mean, you can, they're, they're more expensive, but you can use the, um, like the RV. They have like a gel that you put in there, uh, to solidify things and make it not smell. Um, you can do sawdust and things like that, but, um, kitty litter is pretty cheap. Um, and you can do that and, and then being able to, uh, being able to separate solid and liquid. This is so fun to talk about. Um, but in, in those buckets, um, the liquid can be dumped out even in the yard or the street away from the house. The solid would stay in there with the kitty litter. If you want more information on that, feel free to watch the YouTube video that is in the link. I would like to answer another question. <laughs> it's in the Google document that we have. 
it has links to, to that as well. Um, so, and, and, and on YouTube, there are, there are lots of videos that, would, that talk about um, hy uh, hygiene and toiletries needs in a uh, situation like that, a disaster preparedness. There's different theories on, on what to do on that. Um, again, we haven't had to use that. I really love not having to use that right now. But just thinking through some of those things, and again, five-gallon buckets are our friends, and um, it would be a cheaper way to do it. There you go, the Boy Scout hammock. And part of it is a lot of people are like, okay, well, I'll just go dig a hole in the yard. You can't, okay, you can dig a hole in the yard, but you can't do that long term, and then you contaminate your whole yard and you bring a lot of vermin in. If you're out camping, you're doing it once or twice in an area, in a big wooded area, not everybody is doing it. Um, and so part of this is thinking through what your needs are going to be, thinking if your neighbors are not doing some of these things, what they're doing that will bring vermin or things to you, um, if they're not disposing of waste, moderately waste or other waste properly, you're going to be kind of a, a susceptible to some of this too. Um, th none of this stuff is fun to think about. And none of this, and, and for, I know a lot of us are like, that seems so crazy. That will never happen. I've said that would never happen so much in the last two years. And more and more frequently, that would never happen in the United States. It's happening. Um, and so part of this is thinking through some of this stuff. I pray we never have to use it. I hope we never have to use this. I hope that my kids get to joke and talk to their, their, their kids about how, oh, remember grandma was crazy and was squirreling food away like a, a squirrel or, you know, like a crazy person. That would be great. But I don't think that's the case. I think that we have a lot coming. Um, we know biblically we have a lot coming. And we know that birth pains, we have a lot coming. And just looking at our world and our country right now, we have a lot coming. And so um, it is better to be prepared. Like I used the insurance analogy at the beginning, I don't want to have to use my insurance. That means something happened. I don't want to use my house insurance. I don't want something to happen in my house. But if it does, I'm really glad I had it. This is my insurance. All of this is my insurance policy in case. They're all in cases. I wish. Okay, she's her question was with everything that we've read and we've seen, what is our speculation of things coming with the supply chain and, and all of that. So we see lots of different articles. Um, there was an article this last week that said they think that there's, a ten week, there's 10 weeks of, of wheat and grain left globally. Okay, I don't know. I don't know. I know the thing is, is and some people will say that yeah, but the U.S. produces that, and we do. We do produce, but we don't produce enough to support our country. We have been really, nice word, foolish. Um, we have been very, very foolish because we have been outsourcing everything, and we have been dependent on everybody else, and so we don't grow enough to support us here. And so um, with that being said, there's also been a lot of stuff from drought or too much water and so there's been a lot of crops that have been affected by that. I don't know. Part of this issue is we have a diesel shortage, we have a fertilizer shortage. So this is a different year than these other yeah. seasons of the year. They're talking about NATO countries and the United States doing a NATO blockade to get exports to bring the grain from Ukraine to here or they will get attacked now. That's how bad the grain shortage is. And, and, and again, think about, we are a very flour-dependent country. We are a very, and, and I know there's a lot of other countries that, that bread is like a primary staple in them, but it is in everything. It's not just like, oh, we eat bread. I'm gluten-free, so I know that gluten and bread and wheat is in everything from like hygiene products to ev food. I mean, like it is, it is in everything. So what it will look like will be, will be drastic. And, and I don't know. My only thing is, 
while there is food on the shelves, I want to prep. If I wait for things to get worse, because I, there's a lot of conversations I've had and the people are like, but there's still food on the shelves. Yeah, but if you wait for there not to be food on the shelves, it's too late. You've waited too long. And if I have to go panic by because I didn't do anything and everybody else, we've seen everybody else is panic buying, you're not going to find things or you're going to be paying an insane amount for it. The flip side of that is, which I didn't really plan to get into this part, of, but Iran just started their uh, biometric digital currency, which if you don't have you can't buy. And for them, bread is a huge deal. And so being able to buy at the affordable price the government has said, you have to be part of the system. And if you aren't, they could charge you any amount that they wanted, a million dollars for a piece of bread, because they know they want you in the system. I don't want to be dependent on what the government's going to tell me I can have or not have or ration me. And so I'm going to do everything I can while I can to have stuff in my house to provide for my family. I am responsible for my children. God has given them to me, and I am responsible. And for, for, for what I see and how I feel, is it is my responsibility to look at some of these things and put insurance for my kids. I have to, I do not want my children's growth and development stunted because I was scared and I didn't take it seriously. And so knowing that I want food that they will be able to eat, I want vitamins and supplements knowing that our diet might be a little changing. Maybe our garden doesn't do great because this weather is awful. Um, I want vitamins and supplements to be able to help with some of that um, because I have no clue what the future looks like. But with that too, I'm not going to stop living now. I'm not going to stop living and I'm not going to live in fear. It's easy to get very, very fearful with all of this happening and all of this talks and the what ifs and all of these what ifs we don't know. We don't have the crystal ball. I can't tell you what it's going to look like. I do think that things will get better or look like they're going to get a little bit better before they get infinitely worse. It's the, the lull to lull you into the compliance. But I don't know, but I'm not going to stop living. I'm still going to plan things. I'm still going to enjoy life. I'm still going to do things with my kids. I'm not going to stop living. I'm not going to live in fear, but I'm going to be cautious and I'm going to be smart about it. Um, I'm going to have, uh, have a backup plan. I'm going to think through things a little differently. Um, my husband and I, our, our 20th anniversary is this next week, and we had wanted to go away, never been to Cancun, thought it was a good idea to, a couple years ago. Not a good idea now. So we're staying stateside, but now it's, if something happened and we're not there, we're thinking through how will we get home differently. We're having backup plans, but I'm not going to stop living life now, but I'm going to be smart. While there is resources, I'm going to use them. While I can print things off, I'm going to make a great big binder of crazy and print off everything that I can possibly print off. I'm going to buy the books that I can. I'm going to talk to people and learn skills that I, that I can while I can, while it's safe on that. But I'm not going to be scared. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to be prepared I'm going to pray, and I'm going to share it with people because I want other people to know. I don't want them to say, oh, I'm coming to your house. You're not. I want you to be, I want you to be prepared in your house. I want you to be taken care of in your house. I want you to have the resources that you need. I will help you, but I can't do it for you, and I will share. We have to, we have to look at this as something serious. We have to be able to say, what is God calling me to do? Joseph knew. God told him, hey, you've got seven years of good, and you're going to have seven years of bad. I think we've had the good, and we didn't know that we had the good, and then the bad's here, and we have to do something now. A lot of this stuff, this world economic forum and all this nonsense, they've been talking about this baloney since 2014, and I didn't know. But I know now, and, it, and I am accountable for what I know. What I know now, I am accountable for what I do with it. And it's not saying I don't trust God by being proactive. It's, it's not, not about not trusting God. God's given me the eyes to see what's happening. He's giving me the, the ability to still buy food. I have to be responsible with that now, especially because my family depends on me.
They count on me for this. And you know, I've got friends who think I'm crazy, and that's fine. I love them, and I will pray that God changes their heart and that they are prepared. But my responsibility is my family. And if other people don't agree, I'm not going to fight them on it. I'm going to share everything I can, and I'm going to encourage them. But that's all I can do. And the thing is, is that with all of this we don't know, all of the things that we don't know, the one thing that we can know is where we are with Jesus. Do we have a relationship with Jesus? Are we ready for him to come back whenever that is, tomorrow, in 10 years? We don't know, right? It's looking like everything's coming a lot faster, right? All we know is our relationship with Jesus. We have the ability to share it. We, have the, that, we want people to have eternal salvation, right? We want them to eat. I want them to eat, but I want them to, to spend eternity with Jesus. And we have the opportunity to share it. And so as you're sharing this stuff, it's not about being afraid, and it's not about causing fear in other people. We don't want to scare people. We want to be able to talk to them and say, hey, I've seen this stuff. This, hey, he, listen to the biblical prophecy stuff. Hey, this is the stuff that's coming. This is why I, this is, this is the evidence of it. Like, I think we need to be prepared. Hey, do you know Jesus? Do you know that these are the things that we can have conversations without beating them over the head, without, without causing fear, but getting them to, to look at things and then praying for them because we can't change their heart. I love my friends. I would like to take a five-gallon bucket and beat them over the head and get them to see, see things the way I want them to see it, but I can't. God's the only one who can change their heart on that, whether it's this or their salvation. Our example, our example speaks volumes, right? Like that, she, she was saying that it's our example. It, our example is what draws people to Jesus, right? Like if we're living in a way that is drawing people in, absolutely. We want to be a, a reflection of him, right? We want to be his ambassador. We want to be able to show his love and his compassion and his mercy, right? And we want to speak truth. Jesus spoke truth. He spoke hard truth, but he spoke it with love and compassion. And he did it in a way that drew people to him. I think as Christians, we have to be very careful that when we're speaking love and truth, we're not doing it in a way that is pushing people away. Um, 1 Peter 3.15 that says, In your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anybody who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. And we forget those last two sometimes. We want to speak that truth because we want them to hear it, but we don't do it with the gentleness and the respect part too. And we, we sometimes forget that we can't, no matter what we tell them, we can't change their heart. I can't show them enough stuff with the World Economic Forum and all this other stuff to change anybody's heart. Yes, that's God, right? Like, I can give an example, I can show them, and I can do everything I can to help them, but it's up to God to change their heart. Same with the relationship with him. So, does anybody else have any questions? All right, I'm going to pray, and then we're done. If you think of anything else, I'll stick around for a while. Um, we have our... Uh, canning class is intro. Again, I am a newbie on this stuff. I'm sure there's a lot of you who grew up watching mom or grandma can who probably have more experience than me. Feel free to share it with me. I'm still learning, watching every video I can, but I'm going to do a quick overview um, with canning and try to take at least some of the fear out of it. And then um, talking about water glassing eggs, which most people don't know, and it's an awesome thing. I'll talk to you about it, or you can come to class, but let's pray real quick. Um, God, thank you for today. God, thank you for the sunshine that came out, and thank you, God, for the ability to be here. God, I know that this is so overwhelming, and it's scary, and it seems so far-fetched, but you know all of this. You are not surprised by what's happening, and all of these things are just pieces that fall into place for your coming back. God, I pray that we won't be fearful, but that we will be motivated to be prepared, that we will not be idle, and we will not be... Um, that we won't be irresponsible with the things that you've given to us. God, help us be people who are uh, a light um, in this really dark world, who are pointing people to you and who are showing people um, why it matters. God, help us to um, know the things that we need to do to prepare our family for whatever's coming. Um, I pray that we will be people who um, are called to action in, in every sense of this. God, thank you for the provisions that you've given us. Thank you for the eyes that you've given us to see things and the ears to hear it. And God, I pray that you will um, give us courage to be bold. Help us to be people who um, do not shrink back 
but who boldly go and do the things that you're asking us to do, even if we do it afraid. You know, I pray. Amen.